I think it's it's going to be work regardless. So just find the, the work that you actually want to spend time on versus I think if you're young, just chase a bunch of shit and get in the reps just like in any sport. But then try to find the the path. Like for you guys, I think creating content is like it's so obvious how good you guys are at it. It's like you guys are doing it naturally. Noah, welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah, well, oh, it's up, good man? to be here, guys. It's good to be here. <laughs> Noah and I were just talking before we started recording, before you came on, Greg, about how I had to bail on this like awesome boat event that he and AppSumo were throwing in New York. And my excuse was that I was literally having my baby, you know, during the like two day window when I like, I think you did that on May 15th. Like the kid was my, my son was born on May 16th. Like it was like right the next day. But we were talking about how, you know, there are these like trump card excuses of getting out of things like being pregnant or like having a baby that you can basically get out of anything. Uh, and use it as an excuse. And Noah said, like, why aren't we just honest about things and just say, like, yo, I don't want to go to that. So I don't know. What is it, Greg? Why why aren't we just honest as human beings when we don't want to do things? I think people don't want to let other people down. I think, like, making... So people wa generally want to make other people feel good. And, like, when you let someone down, it doesn't feel good. So I think it's difficult to be honest. But, yeah, I agree with you. I feel like... We should we should all be more honest. <laughs> I'm trying to be we, more honest. Like I think and, we uh, there, like in general, when you think about your calendar, like I think this relates to a lot of things. You think about your calendar and how many like emails in your inbox you put off replying to just because you don't want to say no, but really you're just gonna say no. You're just delaying it, and it's like uh, some someone was just talking to me about this. Rich Handler is his name. He's the CEO of Jeffrey's, you know, big, big financial institution. He was saying like, the reason people don't reply to their emails right away is because they're delaying the pain of just saying they don't want to do something. And so he's like, I reply right away. And I either say like, yes, let's do this right now. Or no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and it's like a much more efficient way of just getting through the things. And I realized when I, when I thought about it, after I went home, when he said it of like, yeah, that's totally what my email inbox looks like. The reason I'm not always at inbox zero is because I have 25 emails sitting in there that are things where I just don't want to reply to the person to say no. Do you owe them a reply? Just hit archive. What do you, what do you owe them? Is it like yeah, I guess step, that's true. Stepfather, you know, like. <laughs> I, I guess that's true. Giving them, like, I think um, it's, it's just having standard protocols makes things easier. Like, hey, I'm only focusing on these three things, so I'm not doing extra meetings right now. Really, really standard makes it easier. It's uh, like, or I'm phone phobic. People love the phone. Yeah. It's like, hey, I'm just phone phobic. Like, it's actually a phobia I have. <laughs> I can't take this. This, you know, I'm scared. I'm scared, man. I, I actually do like the, um, you know, hey, I'm not doing call, you know, not doing Zoom calls. Love to do it in real life if you make it out to New York, um, you know, type thing. Because I do just like, I, I will meet almost anyone in person because I just so prefer that. Um, but man, doing yeah. Zoom calls, like my threshold now is so high relative to what it was a year ago. Um, anyway, I feel like we're on a long tangent. No, but, but I, think, um, I think the thing you're calling out is a really great point and, and just being honest with yourself and like how do you get more alignment in your life, right? And the alignment, what's interesting is like when you had a baby, it was easy to be like, I really don't want to do this, but you're using the baby as a nice buffer to that or I'm you know, pregnant or COVID or whatever these types of excuses are. COVID's pretty, they're all legit. But I, I, it's like, what if you could do if you could just live honestly? Like I have two friends recently, like, I don't want to go to these weddings of my other friend. How do I say no? And I was like, you say no. But I think it's also helpful if you're like, hey, I really want to go. I, I, you don't want to lie to them. Hey, I, your wedding sounds promising. I just have a lot going on. Can't make it. Yeah. I do think that like you, you brought it up a, a couple minutes ago of like, hey, these are the three things I'm focusing on right now. So I can't take this on is a great way of thinking about it i mean it all ties into like people feel these inherent like sunk costs almost um to going and doing things like oh you know i already i've always thought about it with like oh i booked flights i i had this last year like i booked flights to go to this wedding and then the wedding was coming up and i was swamped with other stuff and i was literally dreading it but in my mind i was like oh man i paid for the flights already so i gotta go and the reality was I was just going to go make myself incrementally more miserable by going to this thing. And so then I ended up bailing because I was like, oh, it's actually just a sunk cost. I need to think about this clearly and rationally and just pass on it. Totally. Um, but we have all these like embedded reasons for doing things um, that I do think if you just reset yourself, you can you can totally. step away from. I think a lot of it is energy 
like kind of I think Greg was kind of highlighting it a bit, which is just like, is this increasing your energy and clarity or is it decreasing? And so a lot of times in my week, like I was meeting with our head of marketing at AppSumo yesterday, and I was like, who do you I'm not gonna call I'm not gonna call it people, but I was like, who do you meet with during the week that you're like excited about? And you're like, wow, I have more energy and like I feel productive. And who do you not? And there's probably either the meeting is bad or the person is bad. And so on, on my Sundays and like when I do calendaring on Fridays and Sundays, I'm like, what am I really looking forward to? And is it is there stuff that I'm just not looking forward to? And there's probably some connection that I don't want to do it. And like just yeah. doing that maybe in, in all regards. Yeah, I love that. It's like who, who energizes your battery and who depletes it. Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt with no sugar. It contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio, 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium, but none of the junk. No sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS. I absolutely love it and how it's fit into my lifestyle. Whether you're keto, low carb, paleo, or just wanna feel better and more active, Element is the drink for you. I drink it after an intense workout to replenish my electrolytes. I also drink it after a few too many whiskeys late at night. It totally helps with the hangovers. When you sweat, the primary electrolyte lost is sodium. Athletes can lose up to seven grams per day. When sodium is not replaced, it's common to experience muscle cramps and fatigue. The same goes for after a big night out drinking. Element will fit into your lifestyle no matter who you are. Right now, Element is offering my listeners a free sample pack with any order. That's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. It's a great way to try all eight flavors or share Element with a salty friend. Get yours at drinkelement.com slash happens. This deal is only available through my link. You must go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash happens to take advantage of this special offer. Try Element. You won't regret it. If you're anything like me, your portfolio is a mix of the usual suspects. Stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Maybe you've even dabbled in some alternative assets, like crypto. But those investments can be incredibly unpredictable. You know what typically isn't unpredictable? Apartment buildings, rental homes, industrial facilities, places we go every day to work, eat, and live. That's all private real estate. And thanks to its historical stability, as well as its reputation as a reliable income stream, these investments could be a valuable addition to your portfolio. This is where Fundrise comes in. Fundrise is changing the game when it comes to real estate investing and making this powerful asset class easily available to investors like you and me. Their easy to use app lets you build a real estate portfolio tailored to meet your goals. It's a great way to benefit from real estate's many perks while adding some much needed diversification to your portfolio. So join over 250,000 other investors building a better portfolio with private real estate. Signing up is easy. Just head over to fundrise.com slash room. Again, that's F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E dot com slash room to get started today. You know, I used to do that with my calendar. This is like, I, this is one of my favorite frameworks, actually. I, um, mm. I started energy color coding my calendar in real time after the meetings and it completely changed. I mean, this is like six months ago. Greg, it was actually as a result of a conversation I had with you about like how my calendar was too full. Um, and I, so I literally would like at the end of a day, go to my calendar and color code things green when I felt like they created energy for me, um, kind of like orange if it was neutral and then red if it was like, um, you know, I felt drained after doing it. And it forced me to visually see how many of the things I was taking on during the week were draining energy from me. And so I basically just said, OK, I'm going to eliminate or delegate all of those. And that was Love the first it. step. And it was like, okay, now my calendar looks all green and neutral. Um, and then the next step was like, what can you kind of trim out of the neutral and make it mostly green? And now I feel like my calendar is mostly green and it completely repositioned it just by like having this visual cue and signal. Dude, I love that. I, I, I've been trying for the past two years, like a week in review at the end of the week. So I have like a survey that I give myself on Google Forms and you can kind of see trends Hmm. For like, was it for me? It's really related to AppSumo. It's like, was I consistent? How was my leadership? Did I move the business forward? And then the last thing is like, were there any blockers from this week or meetings that sucked that I want to adjust? And it really does make most of the weeks get uh, 
subsequently better. I feel like feedback and like regular feedback and just in all aspects is how we improve life. That's a pretty so cool that, idea, actually, just like for a business. So, you know, you have, um, you know, you have like a, do you wear a whoop band or like any of the health I wear tracker? I wear the ring at night when I go to sleep. Yes, me too. So band. like the beauty of those things is that it gives you like a trend line over time, right? Like, you know, you, yes. you can see what it looks like, you know, what your different metrics, REM sleep, whatever, over, over longer periods, it becomes really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of a cool idea to like take something and apply that to, you know, your, your kind of personal, uh, productivity, energy, et cetera. Like what you're jerry rigging, um, you know, and like jankily putting together with a Google form or with a Google survey and sending to yourself, there's probably a business to just be built around that, like the personal energy survey or something, um, where you create a nice UI UX and basically overlay it on top of data that is effectively a Google form that you get every week. Dude, I love that. I, I, I think that's great. Here's the idea. Because, you know, sometimes with these things, like we get baseline information and we're like, okay, if I go to sleep early, it's good. If I don't drink, it's good. It's like, there's not really that much deltas of change. It's more just like some level baseline to move forward. So I think it's just like, how do you get more consistent iterations and improvement? I think, so I think the work. idea is like, have you seen those emails where at the bottom of the email, it's like, hey, like, yeah. how, how was this good, bad, okay? Yeah. And so it's basically after the email, after the meeting, you get an email, it starts like getting data points. Was it good, bad, whatever? And it starts adding those data points until it knows enough about you that it's just like, hey, you have a meeting coming up in an hour with Sahil and you like hate meeting with Sahil <laughs> or you or, you know, so we're going to go ahead and like cancel that or you know, you love meeting with Sahil. We're going to when like, you're going to schedule it, it tells you to cancel it. Actually, yeah, just like yeah. don't schedule this because we already know. I actually think there's something really interesting to be built, like a simple tool around this, because like they all exist. And there's like a massive multi-billion dollar industry around like app tracking stuff on your computer or on your phone that like tells you there's something called like Rise Productivity, I think it's called. That's like a computer app that like, yeah, actually, I got it on AppSumo, Noah. Um, it was like one of your deals of the week um, at one point, like last year. And um, it like tells you you know, it gives you all these metrics and data at the end of every week of like what apps you spent your time on, where you were productive, where you got drained, et cetera. But doing that, but for like your personal energy and um, sort of like using it as like a week in review type template that gives you data behind all of that. And maybe it's self-reported, but it's still, you know, actual data that tracks over time and putting a UI UX on top of it. I feel like it would actually be pretty productive. Kind of like it. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, well, I want to come back to that, actually, because there's something interesting to be built there. So we will talk about that. But Noah, you know, it's been super excited to have you on. It's it's taken longer than we should have um, to uh, to do this recording. So I'm happy that we're finally getting to do it. Um, and a handful of stuff that we wanted to just dive into with you. But I thought maybe we could just set the stage for a little bit with like hearing a little bit more about who you are and your background. Cause I, I also just personally feel like I don't know enough about your background and, and um, you know, some of what has gotten you to where you are today. And obviously you're a, you know, amazing entrepreneur and you're also an amazing creator. And so I want to dig into uh dig into a bunch of that, but would love to just hear, you know, what has kind of like created your map of reality um, over your life? Like what, where have you kind of come from and, and how did you end up where you are today? Dude, I have no idea. I was on a date like a year ago and she's like, who are you? I was like, what? I was like, can I just order my dinner at Chick-fil-A and call it a night? I like, who That's am a I? fancy like, date, man. Yeah, You're dude, I think you're the best. That's why I'm probably still single at 40. By the um, way, Noah, I just, I just checked my Gmail. I just put your name in my Gmail and I think I slept in your bed. Um, <laughs> dude, awesome. <laughs> we, we should have opened up with that. Yeah. Were you guys having a sauna party? 2016 uh matt galligan was like hey like my buddy has his apartment up for rent or something like that and i think we might have stayed at your place dude awesome i love hosting i love like i'm uh well that's a whole money thing we can talk about um the short of who i am i don't know man like i'm trying to figure it out uh i try to follow I, you know i try to follow what what really like what i'm listening to my body you could say like what really is calling me uh, I definitely get distracted with shiny objects, but uh, I think my my career and my life has been like what feels right, uh, and then trying a, a, just a shit ton of things out, and most of them not working, and some of them working, and then really surrounding myself with just like epic people, 
I've been very, I think some of my talent is talent. I'm just like a talent, like, uh, you know, those metal detectors for, for pennies and nickels. Like I kind of like that a little bit with people. Um, and professionally, yeah. Uh, I've, I was born into like tech. I, I don't know how my brother became, my brother's a doctor, but I was born like a few miles from Apple and I've, I love tech. I love the computer stuff. I love like all this internet stuff. I love the app stuff. I love the crypto stuff. I just think it's, it's really interesting how it's evolving society. And then AppSumo, uh, you know, professionally was a culmination of just a lot of rejection, uh, a lot of soul searching, a lot of like experiments, and then finally and trying a lot of companies out to finally figuring out how do I work with people I really like, where I don't feel so insecure, working on something I really like, which is promoting things and talking about these things, um, you know, and, and being able to live the kind of lifestyle I want. And so that that's come together. And creating content, I've been doing blogging for a long time, uh, more hardcore lately on YouTube for the past little about two and a half years, specifically around like, you know, uh, starting a business, making money, overcoming fear. So you you were born and raised in Silicon Valley. Yeah, uh, yeah. My and I was kind, of, which was I feel very lucky because my dad is a sales guy. He was like from Israel. He didn't know English, and he just started selling things. And then my stepfather's an engineer, so it was just really cool to to get that mix of personalities. And then I was I was just it's all luck. It's all I was very mostly lucky um, to be born there. And then all of my friends are from, in Silicon Valley are just like extreme high achievers. Like my mm. lowest friend is like a senior engineer at Fitbit. Like that's the worst <laughs> off person I know. <laughs> and like not bragging, I'm just like I was lucky to be born with that type of, you know, uh, expectations. I think something about success is that people are like it's a network, it's network, it's not network, it's who are who's around you and what's their ambition levels. Mm. And I just had really high ambition people around me and it's really inspiring. And and there's a balance of that of you have to figure out your own ambition, like do I want this or am I just competitive or comparative? But that was inspiring to be like, oh, cool. There's a lot of things I can do out there. So do you feel like, I mean, you mentioned the ambition point. I've never really thought about it much. But do you feel like you're kind of, everyone always uses that phrase of like, you know, you're the average of the five people you spend your most time with. Do you yeah. feel like that's about ambition? That like you're really the average of their ambition level? Like if you're around a bunch of people and you come up around a bunch of people who have tremendous ambition, it's hard not to have that same level of ambition and, you know, and, and spend time with them? I think it, you know, I think it sets a bar of what, what things could be. Like, if you don't know what, ex if you don't know what excellent food tastes like, like, how do you know what excellence looks like? Mm. So I had a chance to be like, Hey, I worked around Zuckerberg. I worked around, you know, Mark Pincus and like, you know, Peter Thiel and like the elite and they're elite for a reason. Cause they're, they're excellent. And then I think there's also some just internal motivation. Like I'm just, naturally moving and naturally active and that's that's a little bit just i was born with that i think people want to imitate like the people that the, generally speaking like you know if you're i think you know that's why okay i was reading a study late 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 a few nights ago about how people who have friends who are overweight generally eat more than the average person um <laughs> and 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 then they become overweight. And I think it's it speaks to this point, which is like you probably grew up with a lot of people who were exceptional or tried to be exceptional. And because of that, like, you know, it might it might just, you know, it might have been in you, but it also might have just been you know, yeah, manifestation. Kind of be like that. Yeah, manifestation. Yeah. Of it. Yeah. I, I, I think do like think a parallel oh sorry. No, a parallel ahead. example of that is like I'm in a text group called like single guys in Austin. And it's like all these guys, it's like my three other best friends. And it's always like, dude, I'm on this date. Look at this. Check this out. And like, it, you know, it's a safe space for four single gentlemen. But then one day I'm like, dude, if I'm just surrounded by these bozos talking about hooking up all the time, like, of course, that's why I'm single. You know, and, and it's not that necessarily being single is a bad thing. But it's just like if you're around a bunch of healthy people, to Greg's point, like you'll probably be more healthy. And um I think people are probably aren't as intentional as I, I'm going to brag. I think I'm very intentional about who I surround myself with. And besides these bozo single guys who I love, I'm around a lot of very like intentional people, not just in, in making money. It's not only about that. It's just like an integrity and in follow through character. Um, and just like they inspire me in, in different capacities. And I have, a, there's, it's honestly kind of like amazing. I think that's probably one of the best parts of my life. It's, it's sort of, um, 
it's interesting. Like I have a few thoughts on this. So one is that these kind of things cut both ways. Um, you know, like I often think about, uh, I have friends who don't make a lot of money, totally fine. You know, they're successful, but don't make a lot of money. And yet they, they roll in a circle of people who do make a lot of money and who spend a lot of money. And those friends of mine, um, that role in that circle then are constantly in trouble and stressed because they basically are like living at the means of somebody who spends a lot and who makes a ton of money when they don't have that. And it's like, they've kind of grown accustomed to living in this way by just like, I don't know, like osmosis or something like that. Um, and it creates a lot of issues for them as a result. Um, cause you do kind of like naturally blend into your surroundings for better or for worse. Um, so I've often thought that was, it was, it's just like an interesting fact of humans that we tend to just like chameleon into our surroundings one way or another. Yeah. Is it, can you tell us a little bit about like the insight with AppSumo? Like what actually led to the business creation? I mean, you, you mentioned it as kind of like failure, rejection, things that had gone wrong and led to it, but like the actual insight around what it is, um, what, what was it that sparked that for you? How did you decide to go build it? And, you know, then I kind of would love to just hear a little bit more about the business today. Sure. Um, I think it was a, it was a culmination of all of my failure <laughs> packaged it in one. In what was one your nice... failure? Like you say, you know, I mean, you say that, but like, what was the failure? I mean, the failure was like Intel 14 months, Facebook, nine months, Mint, nine months, Kickflip, 10 months, which was funded by Naval Ravikant. And then I did Gambit, which did really well and then facebook sued us and we got banned by another company and then it was just like i'm 30 years old and i'm just like wow i uh, this is it's not bad i thought i'd be like super rich and like i don't know i thought you just get money magically in your bank account <laughs> and so it doesn't happen that way or i thought i'd have a wife i thought she'd just like show up at the house they don't they don't you have to actually go out and make it happen um and so i think all those different experiences in my life of what i didn't enjoy and what made me feel good and bad led to be like all right well I really want to work with people that, I don't know, are humble. And I felt Facebook and Silicon Valley was just like this level of arrogance I didn't enjoy being around. There's a level of confidence and intelligence, but the arrogance was too much. So I knew I wanted to be with great people, which I didn't really experience. I knew I liked promoting things. I think it's like for all of us, there's some skill we enjoy and we're doing for free. And so just find the thing you want to do for free and make that your job. There's debates to that. I just found that for myself. Where I'm going to be promoting things like whether there's AppSumo or not. Like I'm still mm -hmm. doing this YouTube thing. Or I'm still doing my newsletter at you know, okdork.com. I'm doing these things. And so I was like, I want to keep promoting things. And then through some of these businesses, I realized, like you talked about this one idea, Sahil, earlier. You said, we should help people track uh, their, their work stuff. And I think especially now during a recession, this is where a lot of, this is where like some of the best innovation is going to come out of. I'm really excited to see who's going to be creative here. Like who's going to win? Someone's going to win. Winning is all subjective, but who's going to come out and, and create something special that they'll enjoy? And so uh, I think for me, I was like, man, I like promoting. I don't like doing this payment stuff. Uh, I like software and I, I love deals. And I saw like Mac Heist, which was around for, a do you guys remember that? Yep. Oh, wow. I saw Mac Heist and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. That like enables you to get people, customers, promote cool stuff. I don't have, there's not a lot of pressure. And I, to be candid, and I think most people don't quit your day jobs when you're starting a side hustle and be clear on your vision, be clear on your fan. I, call, I like calling it a fantasy. Like, what if you could live a fantasy? Like, how cool is that? And my fantasy was like, make a few thousand bucks just doing it. Like all these things, I had bad partners, all this different stuff. It was like, just doing it the way I wanted. It wasn't like the aspiration. And, and this is something that someone called out uh, that I thought was interesting. Most aspiration of billionaires or millionaires or multimillionaires was not always that case. Like Mark didn't start Facebook. I'm going to be a billionaire. It's like, ah, let me see if I can meet some chicks online, if we're honest. <laughs> right? And I worked for him, so I know that stuff. It wasn't like, I'm going to go create this world. Eventually, it evolved. So your vision evolves. But I think being clear on what you want in your fantasy and vision was really helpful. So for me, it was like, can I do this thing and make a few thousand bucks promoting and getting basically deals I want on products? And, and that's more or less how it was for the first year. And, and, and I think the thing I, I've got to highlight for people out there uh, for starting businesses specifically, and that's what I'm, I'm known a little bit for, is kind of twofold. One, I just picked a really great industry. That's not because I'm that smart. Like I'm above average smart. I'm not like excellent. I'm like a B plus kind of smart. That's what I aim for. You know, I get almost the good thing, but I don't have to do all the work. And I think one thing is like software just grew so much. 
And I guess I kind of assumed it would, but like, what's going to get even bigger? Like, is YouTube going to get bigger or smaller? Way bigger. TikTok, bigger. Twitter, probably bigger. So go find the categories Mm. that are going to get bigger. So that's one. And then I think with that, secondly, I got very lucky. And I think the other thing is when people are building these companies, like that tracking thing we talked about, especially during a recession, are you building something a must have? Like, I can't live without it. Like right now, go to your credit card bills. What can you not cut? That's a must have. What can you cut? Like even employee wise. Those are nice to haves, unless they're must haves. And I think with AppSumo, there was two p- two components, which is everybody wants more customers in this world we live in. You guys want more listeners. Sahil, you want more Twitter followers. I want more YouTube subscribers. Like those are just kind of what we're, what we're interested in. So I thought if I can give people customers, that's literally the most important thing I can do on earth for these people. And then secondly, I think we got very lucky with our business model, which was we don't have to create anything. We don't have to hold any inventory on anything. And we promote a thing you created, someone else created, and some software creator. We get the money up front, and then we pay them 60 days later. And there's a reason for that. Like, we had to put up all this money and all this, you know, experience and time to get the audience and, and the community. But the model just was was epic. Like, we don't need a big office. Like, we can really it's run it It's a 60-day really cash conversion cycle, though. Like, so you have, like, ne- you're getting just generating cash as you grow, but, like, negative working capital, basically. Is it negative or positive? So we get the money up front and then we pay our partners 60 days later. Yeah, negative working capital. A positive that- working capital is like a like a you know apparel business where you have to pay your vendors and then you yeah. receive money, you know, in 30 yeah. days. And that's a pain in the ass to grow because you're having to fund all the inventory growth. Negative working capital yeah, is the man. other way where like they give you the cash and now as you're growing, you have this float of a bunch of cash that you can be using to invest in things because you don't have to pay your partners for 60 days. That's- it's a yeah, pretty got- incredible I- business model when you make it work. Yeah, ours has gotten really lucky, I would say, with all those things. And I mean, it's a pretty, I think, find a business that you just really enjoy doing. Like, we promote, like, our job is literally to find cool software products, get a deal, and then tell people about it. And that's how, like, the money just comes down. And then we give the partners money, the people get a good deal. I think more businesses aren't figuring out, like, triple win. Mm. They're, like, win-lose. Like, you gave me some money, but you're getting screwed. And I think, there's like, Mint was a perfect example of that. It was, like, free, plus, like, the, plus, like, these partners get money. And it was just like a really cool, like everyone's winning there. But I think it's some businesses that does feel like win-lose. Can you talk you a hit little on more? S- yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little more about like the first year of AppSumo? Because I imagine like now it must be easy. You know, you have this massive audience. People know AppSumo. <laughs> um, but like the first I wish, year, right? I can imagine. <laughs> I wish, dude. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, dude, it gets harder. I thought it, you know, there's a, what's his name? Jim, Jim Roth, Jim Rome quote. It's like, yeah, it doesn't get, it doesn't get uh, easier. You just get better. And I like that a lot because it doesn't get easier. It's just your, your problems get harder and you get better at it. Um, the first e- the, to be in, look, our narratives of our mind are all liars. Like our, like how we reminisce some things is total lies. Like we just totally change the history to sue, sue whatever purpose and whatever moment we're in. Um, but the way I recall it to the best of my ability, and I, I looked at revenue of it recently and it's been 12 years. So our first year revenue was 300,000. And that was me truthfully, just by myself. I really wanted a business where I was like, I don't want to have a developer. I'll do it myself. Don't want to have support. I don't want to have anybody to fucking d- d- depend on initially. Now I can't do it without these, this team. And it was just like kind of work. I think one of the key things that, that people miss in business in general is they're not working backwards from their customer very specifically. So with AppSumo, I literally just once a month, I didn't do a lot of work. I probably worked about like, I don't know, 10, 20 hours a month. I would be like, all right, I want to reach Y Combinator audience. What are the products that I could get deals on that I know that would get it would get upvoted on Hacker News? I was like, oh, well, let me get those. So I got Optimizely, I got Mixpanel. Um, then I was like, how do I get on Lifehacker? That's an audience I want. Well, I looked up all of Lifehacker's top, uh, top-reviewed software they've ever talked about, and I got a deal on that. And I emailed them and said, hey, if I get deals on this, can you promote it? And they're like, eh, maybe. They did. And so it was a very intentional approach of, uh, you know, I call customer first is how I like to label it and working backwards in that. And I treated it very casually, Greg. I wasn't very like, this is going to be a big ass company. I was like, I make, you know, a few thousand bucks every month or so for not too much work. And I, I think one thing that people need to be clear on, especially or whatever you're on your career, I lived so cheap that I didn't have to make a lot of money. I didn't even have like, I was doing consulting for speeddate.com. They were paying me 5,000 bucks a month. And I didn't really do much for them, but they loved me. I was like, dude, that's awesome. 
I was like a product manager for them as a consultant. But I had the 5,000. I lived crazy cheap. And it gave me the flexibility to really find stuff I enjoyed. And I did it very co- comfortably until probably a, around a year in, I hired, you know, I had a, I found a, a developer named Chad, who's still my business partner. And that's an amazing story. And then Andrew Chen, who's one of my best friends, was like, no, you got it. Why don't you take it seriously? And he, you know, he tiger bombed me. He's like, you're going to try to be rich and you're going to grow this big. And I was like, dude, I'm just chilling, man. Just let me chill, dude. He's like, no, make something of your life. And so we switched up the model. We went from bundles to single deals and we went from single deals to like tremendous amounts of, of advertising and giveaways and different things. And the business went from 300,000 to 3 million the next year. Hmm. And it was, that's not normal. And, uh, and so I, the way I think of the first year, Greg, it was, it was enjoyable. It was, um, I wouldn't say professional in the sense it was very hobby. And I think this is a very clear difference in, as, as a baseball player and as a professional in sports or as a professional uh, in business or a professional in a hobby is that are you treating it like a hobby or are you treating it like a professional? And we had a lot of, we eventually people copied us and we we're just very professional. Like I worked at these very impressive companies. I have a very, it's not bragging, but I have a, a, I have a, like we got blocked by PayPal and then I literally emailed or texted the VP at PayPal and got unblocked within like 30 minutes. That's just, it was just luck because I have that network from being in Silicon Valley and stuff. And so I think that gave us an edge over other people as we started professionalizing the business. And, you know, 20, what year in 2022? I mean, it's fucking hard, man. I used to think CEO. So I hired the CEO. His name is Eamon Al Abdullah. You should check him out on Twitter. And I had, I hired Eamon. He ran the company for five years. And I basically just like got pretty rich during that time period. And I really do, didn't do, do a lot of work. And I was like, this is, this is very unsatisfying. Getting a lot of money is, is satisfying. I will not deny that. But like not working is pretty unfulfilling. And I just thought he didn't do shit all day. I was like, this fucking guy, dude, like he makes good money. I don't want to, I can't say his numbers. I'm like, this guy's making all this money. And like, what does he do? CEO. CEOs do nothing. <laughs> he sits around, has everybody else do all this work. And then he quit last year. And I was like, ah, oh, shit, man, I guess I'll try to do it myself. And it's, it's, it's not like a boo-hoo story for me, but it's like, oh, wow, there's, until you're in someone else's experience and really understanding it, um, it was hard to, to really grasp like how challenging it is day to day and like the level of responsibility he had. And so I definitely empathize more with him and anyone leading a team and being responsible for jobs and, you know, running a business. Did you, did you raise money or, or has it been bootstrapped? It's been bootstrapped. It's so cool to, um. You know, it ties back to the working capital point that we were making earlier, but like, you know, the inherent feature of the business model you built is that you're kind of being just funded by customers along the way. So, you know, most <laughs> most venture back business models, they're like gross margin negative from the get go or, you know, or you're having to you know fund a bunch of upfront technology build out. And it's, you know, you're you need a tremendous amount of money up front in order to build that so that you can hopefully get to the point where like you're kind of at the, uh, you know, the benefit point of like the marginal cost of zero of the deployment of the technology. But the reality mm-hmm. is then you have to raise a bunch of VC capital and dilute yourself in order to get there with your business model, negative working capital, you're like, you know, pulling in cash and you don't have to pay for a while. You're able to actually fund all of that growth and all of the growth initiatives with customer money. And so like, you don't really need to raise money uh, along the way and you can maintain that ownership. So it's, it's a pretty cool, um, it's a cool thing to see how it actually played out and flowed that way. Yeah. I can't say is that I'm that smart about it. I, I think more with raising money, we never really had a good use for it because we did have mm. capital and we were profitable from day one. And I think more businesses can be. I don't think we're unique in that. Yeah. I think people get uh, deceived. I think the other thing that's interesting is the advantage we have by, we've talked about going public, like, you know, our revenues are in the eight, you know, very high eight figures. And um, I don't know. I just don't want to be at the mercy of other people. I like being at the mercy of our customers. <laughs> like if they like us and we like them and we try to do our best, they buy and give us money and we can live our lives and hopefully they benefit. And the partners we promote get a bunch of money for us to promote their stuff. Um, I, I like the idea that, and, and not having, it is good to have su- adult supervision. Like we have a board, um, they can't fire me, which is, you know, good and bad, but I think having a board of advisors in general, like I'm seeing one of them tomorrow cause I'm having a bunch of issues is, uh, is critical as in the personal life is I have a council of wise men is what I call it. Uh, but also in your professional life. Yeah, it's, um, 
It's interesting. I mean, you you bring that up, right? That like, you know, not everyone needs to raise money. And there's a lot of businesses that could be profitable from the get go. I I just think Mm -hmm. that there's been this, I mean, it's probably just a relic of the fact that we've been in this raging 10 year bull market where like money was free and you could go raise at a billion dollars after a year of existing. And, you know, I I think in general, people have created this storyline that they're going to follow as entrepreneurs and it's like here's what i'm supposed to do quote unquote and what i'm supposed to do as an ambitious founder is i'm supposed to start this business i'm supposed to raise money from andreessen horowitz at this valuation um, and then i'm supposed to be a unicorn by a year from now and get my forbes article written about me uh you know then i'm supposed to go public (laughs) and it's like okay but take a step back zoom out and as you said i mean and greg would definitely agree with this it's like why do you actually want to do that Um, Is that going to make you happy? Are you going to be incrementally happier from going and running a public company? And like in your case, what does that entail running a public company? It's like now I have to get on quarterly, uh, you know, (laughs) earnings calls with a bunch of analysts and have a bunch of people grilling me and have news articles written about me every time I do something. You know, there's just a bunch of headaches that come with the traditional path that everyone thinks they're supposed to follow. And so I think like one of the great things that hopefully comes out of this, you know, bear market if we're in it is that people actually reassess and take a much more first principles approach to thinking about what they really want to do when it comes to building companies. Yeah. 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 I, I would encourage anyone just to get started. Like, especially if you have a day job, like, you know, I was talking with a, a buddy of mine named Sam from Financial Samurai. And it was like, if you have a day job, number one, kiss your boss's ass a lot right now. A lot. <laughs> it's a good time to kiss ass. It's a fucking great time to build your network because you know, when people are looking to cut costs, they're like, well, who do, who's, who's, who's showing up or who's calling it in, right? And the people showing up generally will have a higher chance and then also build the network right there as well uh, for those times. I think we're going to see a lot of profitable products being created right now just because all that VC money is drying up. And, you know, I think it's just going to, we're going to see a, over the next 18 months just some profitable businesses come out. Like, you remember Groupon? Like, Groupon was like a $30 billion company at its peak. Like, that came out of the great financial crisis. And I think we're going to, we're going to see a lot of businesses kind of like AppSumo where people are going to want deals on one side. And companies are going to want customers on the other side. And entrepreneurs are not going to want to raise money, not because it's impossible to raise money, but just because it's like difficult and and annoying right now to raise money. What do you think? Is is that true though? Because sometimes I'm like, if you're good looking, you're always going to get hit on. (laughs) Like I was say, I was on a date a few days ago and she's like, I have 6,000 guys to choose from. And I was like, I'm one in 6,000. She's like, you were one of the last ones. It's like, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, I think if you have, if you're an Airtable or a, you know, Figma or a Notion and there, and you're, you have a model that works, I, I still think you can raise like stupid easy. Uh, I think the challenge, and you know, I think that's what you're saying, Sahil, is like, if it's like, uh, yeah, we're going to have to do a lot of stuff and there's a lot of uncertainty, it, it's going to probably be a lot more challenging experience. I, I would just encourage people like, to, to not. One. When you're doing zero to one, like pre-seed, seed, that's where it's going to be more difficult to raise. But yeah, once yeah. you have product market fit and you have something that's working, like there's always money. Yeah, it's a flight Dude. to quality at that point too. I mean, it's like all the same money is going to pour at the ones that are working and doing well. Um, you hit on, I, I do want to, Greg, I want to talk Google Chrome extensions um, for sure. <laughs> but before I do that, there were like three <laughs> frameworks that Noah hit on in the context of um, in the context of his business building that I thought were awesome to reiterate for, um, for any entrepreneurs or builders listening. One was um, to go like, just think about what industry is going to be growing a ton in the years ahead. And like, that is a great place to go and build. If you know that like, you know, for, for you, software was going to be much bigger and you can go and build in front of that trend. That's a great place to start. Um, the whole like must haves versus nice to haves framework that you dropped, I thought was really interesting. I've always thought of it as like um, painkillers versus vitamins is the way I always totally. like thinking about that, where you're just like vitamins are nice to have. They might make you feel OK and good painkillers like you need to position if you're going to be selling well, you need to position what you're selling as a painkiller because people are way more willing to pay. And they, if you make it feel urgent. Um, and then that final one was triple win businesses, which I loved. 
like try to create a business model that is a win-win-win where you have like the companies winning, customers are winning, the partners are winning in it. Um, and when you can do that, uh, you know, it becomes much more effective and it's a much easier sell from the early days of it. So a bunch of stuff that you hit on that I thought was just, um, that was just gold. Uh, Greg, can I pass it over to you to kick off this um, little bit of ideation around the Google Chrome extensions? Because I absolutely Dude, loved uh, loved the writing you did on that. So I invested in a company in 2012 called vidIQ. And the founder is this guy named Rob Sandy. He raised like a million dollars from Mark Cuban and Gary Vaynerchuk and all these guys to go build... Uh, the Hootsuite, but for YouTube, or the Buddy Media for YouTube. So a platform that gives you analytics on on YouTube. He did like the pure Silicon Valley approach. Like he got like an awesome office. He h- hired like all these like well-known people. He was burning money like crazy. He was down to his last dollars. This is like 2014, 2015. And he basically got rid of everyone except a few people. He went remote when remote wasn't a thing. And basically was surfing every day, living in Santa Cruz. Kind of like, to your point, Noah, like the, almost like the first year of your business. He was just kind of like, what can I create that generates some revenue? And that would be fun to create. He ends up taking vidIQ and turning it into a Chrome extension. That when you're on YouTube, you go on YouTube and let's say I'm, you know, at the, you know, our, let's say you're on our, our channel, right? The Where It Happens channel, which by the way, you should subscribe. We have like a crazy low amount of subscribers on it. So go subscribe. <laughs> we got to get on Noah's. We got to get on Noah's level, man. <laughs> and you're there. It'll say, you know, when you're on this video, let's say it'll say the vidIQ score is 92. The average, um, You know, views per hour is 2.1. You know, here's the ratio of likes. Here's like the engagement. It basically gives gives you deeper analytics for people who are interested in getting a leg up on uh, on other creators. And then he started. He so he created that for free, and then he started charging for it. Today, fast forward to today. You know, uh, he's doing millions of dollars of revenue a year. His team is like 50 people. Um, the Chrome extension has two plus million users. It's now no longer just YouTube. Uh, they're on TikTok too. And it's also a web app. And it's an incredible story of a business that like, you know, pivoted, did their own thing, passionate guy, um, and use Chrome, Chrome extensions as a great way to get an initial group of users. And then just charge for it so that inspired me to write a tweet thread um around chrome extensions which i'll just pull up really quickly here i basically said people sleep on google chrome extensions but it's secretly a gold mine grammarly loom metamask and honey are companies that started as chrome extensions and created billions of value and then here's why it works people barely uninstall extensions the barrier to install is low Extensions are, quote unquote, always on. So people are daily active users of it. And then people pay for many of them. Hmm. So Hmm. Noah and Sahil, I want to get your perspective as to what do you think about Chrome extensions as a place to be building? I love it. Um, I texted you as soon as I saw this because I, um, so I invested in this bit. It was the first time I'd ever really encountered Chrome extensions. And this is kind of embarrassing, but like I had just never really used Google Chrome. Um, and so I was like completely unfamiliar with the Chrome ecosystem. And then I started using it and um, basically had gotten approached right around that time by this founder who was building a Chrome extension that allowed you to um, split payments across multiple credit cards. So like, you know how, you know, if you go to a store and you're buying like a big purchase, you know, like a laundry machine or a fridge or whatever, you can like take two credit cards and be like, hey, split it across these two and they'll do it for you, like at Walmart or Sears or wherever you are. Um, You can't do that online, incidentally. Like it literally didn't exist. Um, You can go and you put in one credit card, you have to spend it. And that's challenging for big purchases. It also presents an issue where like, you know, if you want to manage your credit, you don't want to overextend within one credit card. 
And then also you might want to optimize across points and rewards across different credit cards. And so this guy invented this Chrome extension that basically creates a kind of an instant um, card that splits it however you want across multiple credit cards. And I had no understanding of like Chrome extensions or how he was going to go to market with it. Anyway, now fast forward like three months after initial launch and they're doing, you know, 10 plus million of GMV through this thing um, without having a single dollar of marketing expense yet. Um, have not spent a dollar. It's been all completely organic and like product led growth of people sharing this stuff. And so that was what opened my eyes to the power of these things of like just how much you can do with them, um, especially because they're cross internet. Like you just have it plugged in. You can use it wherever across the internet now on different transaction sites for this. Um, Honey was the same way, I imagine, in the early days. So I, um, I think it's super interesting. There has to be a lot of cool stuff to be built here. That business is called Kashish, by the way. K-A-S-H-E-E-S-H. Like cash. Kashish. Jeezy. Well, they work on, they should work on their name. <laughs> they need to put a little juge on that, so... <laughs> I, I think uh, my, my just two comments, you know, maybe you don't want them, I'll shut the hell up. But I, I, think, I think, you know, two observations here. One is, I think it's wrong to look at where necessarily the biggest size of audience is and be like, I need to build a business there versus like, what's the actual problem? And then what's the best way to resolve it? And I think this is where people get trapped. Like a lot of entrepreneurs are like, I need recurring revenue. What's the best way to get people to give me money every month? I'm like, well, make something they want to give you money for every month. <laughs> uh, but I think that that line of thinking needs to be reversed generally, which is working backwards from the customer's problems that they're excited. Like, I think that's the thing with Absumo. Like, they were, I've tried a lot of other businesses since then and before then. It was like, this is the first one where we're like, they're like, please let me give you money. I was like, damn, this is cool. And the second thing is that um, I do think Google Chrome is big. Uh, I've bought Google Chrome and I've ran Google Chrome business. It's called Leo.io. And Things always seem easier or cooler or bigger than when you when you actually do it. And you're like, damn, this is hard. <laughs> and so we tried to monetize it, didn't work. We tried to drive ads to it, didn't drive ads from it, didn't work. The growth loops from it weren't that hard. And then the, a lot of the people, if you try to buy a, a Google Chrome app, are actually pretty premium priced. But I, I think you guys are onto something that there's there's a lot of people here. They're probably actually rich, like wealthy for internet standards because they're on Chrome, right? Versus probably like maybe other browsers. Or they're maybe on Android. Well, I guess Android would be Chrome. But I think they're definitely have more money. Um, I, I think what you're saying, so is also is interesting. It's like you could study the ones that are doing well, like Rocket Reach, I think is a huge one that no one talks about. Um, I think there's a lot of these ones. But I would try to work backwards on the customers and then not assume that this one thing is going to be easy because it almost never is. It sometimes is. But we bought it. I spent 25000 I paid a dollar for every active user. And then two years later, now it's just like collecting dust and getting emails from people wanting to monetize it in some scammy way. I agree with you, Noah. I think like the trap, the trap that entrepreneurs make are like, okay, there's a lot of action here in, in Chrome extension. Now I need to like build a Chrome extension. Like Rob Sandy from vidIQ, like when he was surfing in Santa Cruz, he was like, he was a, he was, he actually created a YouTube competitor called Vidler in 2005 around when YouTube came out in 2005, like he, had, he was, he under, like he's OG day one YouTube video creator. So, you know, to your point around your earlier point around passion and, you know, do things that you basically have a competitive edge on, like he understood it. And then he was like, okay, the, the tool is going to be on an extension because it's just way easier for creators when they're on YouTube to have this extension and use it and it'll be 10 times quicker. Um, he wasn't, he wasn't like, Oh yeah. Like, uh, I, I, you know, this is a huge opportunity. I need subscription revenue, um, at all. It just came once people yeah, fell I, in I, love with it. I, I think you're calling out the right thing though, which is like, what are industries or categories that are getting bigger? And then where is it being underserved? I do think sometimes though, as an entrepreneur, I always think my the, the other thing is going to be so much easier than mine. I'm like, dude, I'll do Chrome. Finally, it'll be so cake. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna finally get super rich, and then I do it. And I'm like, ah, oh, I thought it was supposed to be, like I read Greg's tweets. I thought it was supposed to be super easy. I think it's it's gonna be work regardless. So just find the the work that you actually want to spend time on. Versus, I think if you're young, just chase a bunch of shit and get in the reps, just like in any sport. But then try to find the the path. Like for you guys, I think creating content is like 
it's so obvious how good you guys are at it. It's like you guys are doing it naturally, naturally now after putting it in, but it's, it's kind of like uh, lubricant versus friction. Hmm. And so I try to find the areas that I'm like, I like creating content. I like sending emails. Like it's kind of what AppSumo does. Why do you do all the content? Like you've built a massive YouTube presence. You do a ton of videos. They're great, by the way. Yeah. Like Thanks. you go, I see you like knocking on doors, talking to, talking to people, um, oh, fuck, fuck, dude. I, which, which I got shredded on the internet a few weeks ago for, for suggesting. Um, but, uh, <laughs> so yeah, no, stupid. like just what, uh, what has, um, what has led to that? Like, why are you, why are you excited about creating content? Probably insecurities and ego, if we're all honest, you know, some <laughs> form of legacy. Like, I hope people remember me or think I'm like smart or special. Do you think uh, that's a thing? Like, do you think, I think that it's anyone a, it's will sub- remember any of us? No, not at all. Yeah. No one's even going to know Elon Musk. That guy's fucking gone. Yeah. Lame. Like, not lame in a bad way, but like in like a hundred years, maybe remembered. Maybe. Yeah. And people today is like God here. Fine. No problem. Like, thanks for building this cool stuff. But I think we're overly fixated on the reality that like there's almost none of the, like any tr- like uh, building. I always thought about this at colleges. Like you get a building. Dude, they're going to rename that shit in 50 years if it still exists. Sayonara. So I think I think part of I wrote you know, about this recently. Like I, I yeah. just think I, I think it's like I think it's such a false pursuit. I just think it's like an unfortunate false pursuit, actually, the whole idea of legacy. Because mm. the reality is in like I like you said a hundred years. I was gonna say a thousand. Like no matter what, in a thousand years you're all forgotten. Like how we many don't people even from know what happened a thousand, a thousand years, years ago, ago do we remember? Well, and, yeah, like we don't remember like, shit. Dude, like you know, like Socrates and like a few random, pe- you know, Jesus, whatever. Like, there's a few people out there that we remember, but the Jesus reality is, is the like- only guy <laughs> that we know from two thousand years ago, and there's still debate if he's true. Well, we're all Jewish here, right? So like Abraham, <laughs> Isaac, you know, like we got we got some other guys out there. Uh, we got some other dudes out there. Hunter, are you half but, uh, Indian? No, half but Jew? like I mean, are are human? What's that? You're half Indian, half Jew. Yeah, I'm a Hindu, dude. I've only I think you're the first ever. I've only heard about you. That's- yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Well, I, I heard about two thousand years yeah. ago. You're in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah mo- mostly, like when I tell people I'm Jewish, most people because they see me, they think I'm Sephardic. Like they think, yeah, you know, it, just because of my brown skin. But yeah, no, my mom is Indian Hindu. Um, yeah, and my dad's white Jewish from the Bronx. Okay, let's ask that. I think that's a little bit. Why do I like doing this shit? Because one, I, I like marketing, and it's really a marketing problem. It's like who is the audience? To, I call them underdogs. They're eighteen to thirty-five mm. year old men that want to start a side hustle or a business or solopreneur and they don't know what to do and they want inspiration. And I make content that inspires them. Uh, I do it because I, I like making the content. I like seeing what goes viral. I like looking at the metrics and then tweaking it. And then I personally, I get a lot of joy engaging in the comments. I really like responding to almost all the comments myself. Um, and so there's that. I think the, the question I was curious though is like, what's with Jews? <laughs> It's always funny when you start with that. What's with what's with Jews and all of us? Is that loving... the end of the question? No, no, no. Why do we love <laughs> broadcasting? Like all the Jews, are like comedians, Twitterians, like disproportionately, like there's a, a lot of Jewish people. I don't know. There's something interesting about our culture. It goes back to the Bible. It goes back. Yeah, what to... happened in the Bible? So it what goes happened? back. To I've never read the Bible. The golden calf. And you know the story? No. Mm-hmm. Go on. Okay. So. I mean, this okay, so basically the story is Moses was in the desert with the Israelites. They flew, they fled from Egypt to go to Israel. And in the process of that walk, I believe what happened was the Israelites started worshiping pagan gods and symbols. And uh, that's when Moses went up to Mount Sinai and got the Ten Commandments from God, so to speak. And I feel like Moses broadcasted to all those people at the bottom of Mount Sinai to, to help them sort of see back, see back Judaism and, and give them the, the Ten Commandments. Was that the first tweet, would you say, the Ten Commandments? He's like, here's a listicle. I've got a, I've got a, te- I've got a, what 10 is it? A things to improve your life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, you, put, you guys both put out a lot of content that I think does that, you know? You, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a tried and true, right? Like uh, Buzzfeed, uh, you know, created a billion dollar business around that. Um, you know, just the numbers grab people, 
you know, you get the like, um, you know, the clear, the clear effect of like hooking people in. I mean, let's be real, like YouTube, like every single platform, the people that have built big presence, like you, you uh, continue to lean into the things that are grabbing people. Like how many YouTube videos say like how I bought eight Lamborghinis in for 10 grand in a weekend. Like that's every video when you go to it, because those are the things that are hooking people. So it's like human nature in some way, shape or form um you know is attracted to these more- like neatly packaged things i mean it's the brilliance of the 10 commandments it's like 10 commandments i know like that the encompasses my whole world it's like great marketing <laughs> if jews believed in hell all of us are i'm definitely going well, i don't know if i'm going i think i'm doing my best to to stay wherever the hell jews go i the other thing that's interesting so hell about that is um i think more people should do like culling is it culling the right word which is like a pruning like i pruned really aggressively in all my content like on instagram i think i followed 20 people because it's just like attractive people and some watches uh, i think youtube is like really i watch poker and squash and then my videos i don't like i see these other business guys they drive me crazy i'm, I'm like just block them then you know on twitter too like i go through seasons i'm like oh i really want to get this kind of content and then I, i'm like i don't know that's not certain and i think people could be a little bit more intentional uh about the the inputs and then just get over get get like brainwashed with positive inputs Right, like get brainwashed with TikTok. I don't. I try. I try to get addicted to TikTok. It's hard for me. I just think it's so garbage. It's a, it's a relatively state owned corporation that controls the data of a whole lot of American teenagers, and that is scary. What does me. that say though? That the American teenagers don't give a fuck about it. They're like, I don't care. And even teenagers, there's a lot of adults. Even myself, I put up on TikTok, and I'm like, they can have my garbage videos. I think they're they're taking yeah. all my diarrhea. And uh, follow me. It's TikTok just so abstract. On a micro level, it's so abstract. It's like hard. To, it's one of those things where it's like for one person, it's very hard to conceptualize what that means. But in the aggregate, if it means that, you know, in a hot or cold war with China, they could make slight tweaks to the algorithm that completely influence what all of our teenagers are seeing and how they're thinking on a daily basis. That's pretty scary. But like for an individual, I don't really know what that means for me. I'm not going to be skewed by whatever I see. You, you immediately, you know, you have an arrogance around it. So I, don't I, know. I, th- I think it's scary geopolitically. I really do. If you're anything like me, your portfolio is a mix of the usual suspects, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Maybe you've even dabbled in some alternative assets like crypto, but those investments can be incredibly unpredictable. You know what typically isn't unpredictable? Apartment buildings rental homes, industrial facilities, places we go every day to work, eat, and live. That's all private real estate. And thanks to its historical stability, as well as its reputation as a reliable income stream, these investments could be a valuable addition to your portfolio. This is where Fundrise comes in. Fundrise is changing the game when it comes to real estate investing and making this powerful asset class easily available to investors like you and me. Their easy-to-use app lets you build a real estate portfolio tailored to meet your goals. It's a great way to benefit from real estate's many perks while adding some much-needed diversification to your portfolio. So join over 250,000 other investors building a better portfolio with private real estate. Signing up is easy. Just head over to fundrise.com room. Again, that's F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E dot com slash room to get started today. Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt with no sugar. It contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio, 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium, but none of the junk. No sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS. I absolutely love it and how it's fit into my lifestyle. Whether you're keto, low carb, paleo, or just want to feel better and more active, Element is the drink for you. I drink it after an intense workout to replenish my electrolytes. I also drink it after a few too many whiskeys late at night. It totally helps with the hangovers. When you sweat, the primary electrolyte lost is sodium. Athletes can lose up to seven grams per day. When sodium is not replaced, it's common to experience muscle cramps and fatigue. The same goes for after a big night out drinking. Element will fit into your lifestyle no matter who you are. Right now, Element is offering my listeners a free sample pack with any order. That's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. It's a great way to try all eight flavors or share Element with a salty friend. 
Get yours at drinkelement.com slash happens. This deal is only available through my link. You must go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash happens to take advantage of this special offer. Try Element. You won't regret it. Dude, this was this was awesome. Thank you so much for uh, for joining and doing it with Yeah, my us. wife we is getting will, me to uh, leave right now. I got to go. She's like, oh, the kid yeah, and the wife. Well, I She's can like, actually... Legitimately, I can actually hear a screaming baby. Um, And so that's generally my cue to leave. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you have any questions that you want featured in a future episode, email us at hi at trwih.com. Leave us a review at Apple or Spotify to help us grow the reach of this podcast. Until next time, we will see you soon.